Welcome to the Vita Day Bible School. We are, well, we have just started a conversation about the letter to the Colossians. And uh, I would like you to read with me, going to the book of Colossians written by Paul. Uh, we are in chapter 1. We've just started. We will probably, uh, let's, well, let's read from verse 3. That's where we left off uh, in our last recording. And just read through it and see what we can learn from what Paul is writing to the believers. Now, in that, um, in, in this passage, we will, learn, we will learn something about God. We will learn something about God's message. And we will learn something about the effect of God's message on our lives. So let's start with verse 3, Colossians chapter 1. If you are uh, following me in your Bible, well, that's actually the best way to go about. You could uh, listen to me, just listen to me speak about Colossians, or you can listen to me and read it in your Bible. That's the best option. So do that if you're in a position uh, to read it yourself. Verse 3 says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. Now, if I remember correctly, in our last recording, we talked a little bit about the love and faith component of this verse. Why does Paul mention when we heard about your faith and your love? And we said, and I'll just briefly summarize it here, we said, because faith in Jesus is not a mere uh, cognitive exercise. It's not just something that, you know, I decide, okay, I'm going to believe these statements. I, I uh, subscribe to them. Um, faith is the very deep stirring within my heart that Jesus is who he said he is. And um, the evidence of this deep stirring is the fact that I submit my life to him. So I believe very deeply that he is the Lord of all. And because I believe this very deeply, I am moved by this. Uh, I'm convinced of this. You can see in my life that I submit to him. No use in saying you believe something and then you don't act on it. So uh, the, the biblical definition of faith always, always, without exception, has these two components. First and foremost, faith speaks of the conviction that Jesus is who he said and says he is. That is the, the primary definition of what faith is. And along with that, never separated, ever, in the entire scripture, never, never separated, is the fact that I can prove from my life that this is indeed my conviction. So that's why Paul writes, when I heard about your faith and your love. Now, let's just, just, just for a moment, remind ourselves why love, because that was the, well, I will call it a stern commandment, but the decisive commandment. We get in, in uh, John chapter 13, well, we get it 13, 14, 15, 16, uh, tones, the direct command and tones of the command um, in, those, in those five chapters prior to Jesus' arrest in, in the Gospel of John. Um, John chapter 13 is when we hear this, uh, Jesus was washing the feet of the disciples and he told him, he said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now, he repeats this command several times in that discourse, that conversation during the evening. And he said, um, uh, you see what I am doing? I'm, I am your Lord and Master. You call me Lord and Master and that is right, that is correct. That's John chapter 13. So you have to do what I do. I am your Lord and Master and you have to imitate me. Yeah, and, uh, and so this, this is a very strong command. Um, if you 
want to be my friends, you have to do what I tell you. What did he tell us? Well, in the context of that conversation, he told them to love one another. We can say with ease that you can see that somebody submits to Jesus Christ as Lord by his love for his fellow believers. That is the first implication, the way he lays down his life uh, for his fellow, fellow believers. I, when we heard about your faith in Christ Jesus and your love that you have for all the saints, that's, that's the, the reaction on the command that Jesus gave, the direct command. It's very tangible, it's very concrete. It's not abstract and philosophical. So it's measurable, you can measure it. This is an important thing. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. There is much to be said about the hope that is laid up for us in heaven. And I think this is a phrase that is often missed in uh, modern day uh, Christian societies, is where we overemphasize uh, the fact that somebody came to faith in Christ Jesus and, and professed his or her faith, um, professing and confessing Jesus as Lord, and then we say, you have been saved. There's much emphasis on, on that part of salvation. You have been brought from darkness over into the kingdom of the Son of God's love. Colossians chapter 1. And you are now saved. But the thing is that Scripture does not only speak of salvation in those terms. Definitely you have the being brought over component, but there is also the component of being saved daily. And then the final component of salvation is the final salvation is uh, the whole idea of growing up into salvation, as Peter would put it. Or Paul would say, we are closer to salvation now than we were when we first came to faith in Christ Jesus. So it's not only the past tense component, it's also the present day, the present reality of being saved daily, but the consummation of our salvation, the completion of our salvation uh, when Jesus comes back, the, the return of Christ, or when we breathe our final breath, whatever comes first, and we are united with Christ in the life hereafter. The, the completion of salvation. So, uh, and I have heard biblical scholars speak on this um, in the past, and, and it's a wonderful way of putting this, and that is by saying, I am in the process of salvation. Now, this might ruffle your theological feather somewhat, but it is, it is very in line with, what, with how Scripture describes and depicts this truth. And we, uh, again, I'm saying we come from a, we are in a time where uh, much emphasis is placed on the day you were born again, you were saved, you know, as if that is the only thing to say about the salvation of God. And it is not. So we need to heed the, the, the whole picture, the whole message of how salvation works. Of course, it comes with its own set of questions. And uh, we can maybe spend time on that uh, later when we deal with that specifically. So here Paul reminds them, he says, your, your faith and love, your faith in Christ and your love for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven and the hope that is laid up for you in heaven is the completion of your salvation, being saved finally and being united with God for all eternity. The hope that is laid up for you in heaven. And Peter speaks of that uh, in more detail. You can read about it. Maybe you have a Bible with a cross reference and you can go to the first letter of Peter, chapter 1. And well, actually the whole letter, 1 Peter. And uh, it will give you 
more insight on that. So he continues in verse 5 saying, Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel. Of this what? Of this hope that is laid up for you in heaven. You have heard before when you heard the gospel. When you heard the message of Jesus Christ, you also heard of the result of, uh, of the work and person and truth of Christ. And the result is when you heed Christ, you, you uh, are included in the salvation of God. You are included in the mercy and grace of God. Uh, and, and in the mercy and grace of God, there is hope for you that, to be eternally united with God. The, there's a guarantee for you in Christ. The guarantee, which is also your hope, uh, is that you will be forever united with God and completely rid of the power, the effect, and the presence of sin. So he continues writing, he says, Of this you heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing. The gospel is bearing fruit and increasing. Now, about the content of the gospel, we will speak more about this, and I think we touched on it in our last um, recording. But the content of the gospel is very important to understand. Again, I need to say this, uh, it is very important to understand for several reasons, of which the first one I would like to mention today is because our understanding of what the gospel is and what we read in scripture the content of the gospel is is totally different especially um, where i come from so we have a certain idea of what the gospel is and what it should sound like but when we read scripture we see something else uh, and we we understand that there's a disparity um, there's a there's a difference between our current postmodern understanding of the gospel and the well the definition of the gospel in scripture but we will definitely come back to that point uh, later so it, it has it's bearing fruit and it's increasing as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth now the grace of God in truth is a, it's a, it's a powerful phrase to understand. We, we need to understand the grace of God, but it's only available in truth. We can talk about the grace of God and give it our own spin, give it our own angle, and it is then not in truth, not as God presents it, which will mean we will talk about the grace of God, but not have it, not experience it, and, and not have it actively working in our lives, which is a powerful statement, you know, to make. But it is an important one to make, especially of the times that we're living in now. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, so that, that is the person that preached to them the gospel in the beginning, to these people in, in Colossia, you heard it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, uh, Epaphras came to Christ, came to faith in Christ through the preaching of Paul, and he was the one preaching in Colossia. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Um, your love in the Spirit. So you will, you will encounter many of these phrases in the book of Colossians that... Um, you know, we'll read it, your love in the Spirit, and then somehow decide, yes, we understand this, your love in the Spirit. And then often, and this is, this is now my discovery in my own heart and ministry and in, you know, the society where we live, uh, and then give it a meaning that is actually not the intended meaning of Scripture. So we want to rid ourselves of all the meanings we have attached to biblical phrases and truths um, that, that wasn't the intended meaning. We want to discover and understand the intended meaning, not the inferred meaning, not something that we read into the scripture and give it our own spin and twist. Why not? Because 
the life of God is only available on the terms of God. So we can use the message of God, twist it around, give it our own meaning and our own angle, and then market it as, as the gospel. But we will not experience the life of God. Why not? Because the life of God is on His terms, not on our amendments to His message. We want to stick to His message. We want to hear what He has to say the way He, he is saying it. And we want to embrace what He is saying fully and completely without amending it in any way, either by adding or by subtracting to the message. Well, why not? Because He is the origin of life. He is the origin of the message. And most importantly of all, He is God, not us. There is a God and it is not us. So that's the, that's the important thing to understand and say. Let me just add something else to this, just by way of explanation, saying that God... Just, let, let's just remind ourselves that God is not a Baptist. And uh, he is not reformed either. He is not a Catholic. He's not an Anglican, a Presbyterian, a Methodist, a Evangelical, or a Charismatic. He's not progressive. He's not liberal. He's not conservative. He is God. He is, a, he is exalted above all the, the, the little etiquettes, uh, or labels rather, the little labels that we have, um, you know, trying to put people in boxes or ourselves even. God is exalted above all boxes, all labels and little divisions. So we're not talking about, when we talk about the gospel, we're not talking about a Baptist gospel or a reformed gospel or a postmodern gospel. We are talking about God's gospel, who is exalted above all time, all cultures, all circumstances, all peoples. And He never changed or will change. He is yesterday, today and forever exactly the same. He has been before time was. So we want to, we want to understand and discover and embrace what God is saying. This is the important thing. And I have to protect my own heart uh, by not uh, taking what God is saying and, and give it a, a twist. You know, either a, a cultural twist, a postmodern twist, or a Baptist twist or whatever label, you know, I mean, you can put your own labels there. I, I need to understand that God is above that. I have to hear what He says without the, the added flavors. Important thing to, to know. And so, Paul continues in verse 9. He says, From the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. This is an important thing for me. It's, it's an interesting thing to note. The day we heard of your faith, and your love, we, we haven't ceased to pray for you. We understand by hearing of your faith and your love that you truly have submitted your lives to God. And you need special prayer. And that's, a, that's such an interesting thought here. From the day we heard of this, we never stopped praying for you. We never ceased to pray for you. You need special prayer. Now we hear that you've heeded to Christ, that you came to faith in Christ Jesus and that you obey Him in your everyday lives. You need special prayer. Why do they need special prayer? Well, for obvious reasons. There, there is, they will now encounter a battle they probably have never encountered before, and that is the battle between their, what Paul will call in Galatians chapter 5, between their flesh and the Spirit of God. There is, there is still things within me that, wants to, that want to rebel against 
the authority of God. I have heeded to His authority. I have heeded to His word. But I will encounter many situations where there is a battle between, between adhering to myself or the authority of God. Now the battle is, I think, I'm struggling to get the English words here as I usually speak in Afrikaans, but it's to maintain myself rather than heeding to God. And, and I have a, a default setting in my flesh, my sinful flesh, that wants to do his own thing, the way I want to do what I want to do, the way I want to do it, when I want to do it. And, and now there's a conflict because the Spirit of God that is within me challenges me on those points. And I have the choice to either go with my sinful flesh or submit myself to the Spirit of God. So that's, that's one thing we can say why these people need special prayer. They are encountering, encount, yeah, encountering a, a, a battle. But, but also they would need special prayer because they have been part of the world and the systems of this world that is directly under the authority of Satan. As Paul describes in Ephesians chapter 2, for one example, there are many other passages that really go into this truth. And they've been part of this world, and th th this world as a whole rebels against God. And suddenly they are not part of the system anymore. So the battle is not only within them and in their hearts, but also in society. And they will now, for the first time, encounter how their own families and people who were their friends for many, many years, and the, you know where they work, their employers and employees and even government officials, will turn against them for their faith in Christ Jesus. They need special prayer. So. Since Paul heard of their faith and their love, what was he praying for them? He says, he claims to, they, they have not ceased, we have not ceased to pray for you. So this is an urgent, serious matter and it, uh, and it engages Paul and his, his, his fellow workers totally and completely. So what does he pray for them, knowing all this, knowing about the battle within and the battle without. To name two things, there are, there are more, probably you could add to the list why they need special prayer. He says, and this is what we're asking, this is what we're praying. We're praying that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Let's just take that in for a moment. That you will be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So if I have to explain it very simply, we would say that you will attain the knowledge of God's will not only in theory, but also in the wisdom of how to put it into practice in the various situations that you find yourselves in. How to apply the will of God in your family, your marriage, where you work, uh, in relation to your neighbors, and society as a whole, in general, knowing the will of God, but also knowing how to apply the will of God so that you will not walk in, in foolishness or in, in a, in not in wisdom, that you will, that you will walk in wisdom um, in society, among, among the people. Why is that important? Well, 
several reasons I can gather, but the first thing I can think of is that you will not draw unnecessary criticism towards yourself. You are already a target. You will be. Everybody who wants to live a godly life, Paul writes, will be persecuted. So you are already up for persecution. But that you will not draw unnecessary attention, that's the first thing I could say. The second thing we could say also, why that is important not only to know God's will, but also to know how to apply it, is that you will not, through your actions, maybe unwise or even foolish action, actions, even though your intentions are noble, you want, to, you want to do the will of God, but you are unwise in how you apply it, that you will bring undue criticism on the gospel or the person of Christ. I think... You know, that's the direction to move in, why this is important. And probably, I think you can think of more reasons why this is so important. Knowing God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Also, we need to say there, and we can maybe make, try to complete this, um, uh, you know, end the video with this, this thought. We could say, the will of God is paramount for the disciples of Christ. The will, what, the will of God, what He wants. Paramount. When we talk about the kingdom of God, we're talking about the domain of His rule. So we are part of the kingdom of God, the domain of His rule. And in the kingdom of God, the authority and the word and the will of the king is absolutely paramount. It defines the kingdom. So for the disciples of Christ, what we want to know with all our hearts is what does the king want? Because we understand that our life is in submitting to what He wants. We have been living for ourselves our entire lives, where the only thing that was important is what we want, how we want it, when we want it, and, you know, whatever concerns us, that was the absolute focus of our lives. We understood through the gospel of Jesus Christ that that is a sure way to destruction and to death. That is the sure way of incurring the judgment of God on our lives. Because we have exalted ourselves to the position of God's. We decide, we say, we determine. That's the road to perdition. But now, through the gospel of Christ, we came to the realization that there is a God and it is not us. There is a Lord and it is not us. And we have confessed our rebellion to Him. We have acknowledged the fact that we are enemies of God, rebels against the will of God. And we've submitted to Him. To his will. Now, I, I, I understand that many people uh, have surrendered to God's blessings, not God's authority. Many people who have said, you know, to, to give their lives to Christ, never gave their lives to Christ. They gave their crises to Christ. Maybe their broken marriage or their financial situation, precarious financial situation, that they've surrendered to Christ. You know, I come to you, please fix this. They haven't submitted to the authority of Christ. And now because they've done that, they've surrendered their problems to Christ, they were told that they are now Christian. 
they were told that they are now part of God's family. Well, that is just a straight out lie. That is not true. I can show you in scripture how Jesus separates himself from the people who want to associate with him for what he does, for the miracles that he performs. They want to separate, you know, they want to associate with him, but who doesn't? Who doesn't want to associate with a God that is full of party tricks? with a God that can just fix everything that we break through our rebellion and our um, disobedience, our marriages, our lives, our relationships, our financial position. Who doesn't want a God that will make us richer and richer and richer? Who doesn't want a God that has a million dollar American dream? That's how we, we depict well, how God is depicted to millions of people. But that is not the gospel and that is not the God of heaven and earth. The gospel is first and foremost the message of who Jesus is, that he is who he says. And then the gospel is a reaction to that that I realize that I've been living in rebellion and in sin and in disobedience and therefore I'm not a friend of God. He's not friendly towards me. I'm his enemy and he will crush me. And I surrender to him. I confess my rebellion and I surrender to him, to his authority, to his will. And because... I do that, not only did that, it's not a past, mere past tense action, you know, on the 17th of April 1987, I gave my life to Christ. No, it's giving my life to Christ continuously, every single day, until I meet Him face to face. It's, it's the being faithful to the will of God and the authority of Christ and keep on submitting to Christ and that is where salvation lies. So if I want to talk about the grace and salvation and mercy of God, if I want to talk about the life of God and being united with God, I need to understand that the cost of that, because it's often, it's often told to people, often. I heard it, well, where we come from, you hear it often, that this is unconditional. And it is limitless and unconditional. Well, again, that is just, it is just not true. The life of God is not unconditional. The grace of God is not unconditional. The only time uh, the actions of God were unconditional was when he sent his son to die. That sending Jesus was unconditional. But for me and you to receive whatever Jesus um, attained for us, that is extremely conditional. And we have to be careful with how we go about with God's message. Because He has the final word about the effect. So if we want to experience the life and the grace and the love of God, we need to understand what He's saying and agree with it 100%. We cannot agree with God only 99% because that would mean that we still have not uh, surrendered the fact that we think we're gods. That we, there's still some points that where we can, we can differ from God and where we have an alternative view that also counts because we think we're on his level. We're not on his level. We will never be. He's uncreated, the creator. We live within a specific time span and we've, we've been created. We are dependent on him. He's not dependent on us. So these are uh, very important truths to understand. And, and especially, especially in the time that we live in. So where, where were we? We said, 
Yes, to know His will. Let's try to finish with that thought. It's so important for us to understand. Paul says, I never cease to pray for you since we heard of your faith and your love that you will be filled with the knowledge of His will, not yours, not mine, but His will. Because that is what it's all about. It's about Him, what He wants, not about us and what we want. Oh, that's an important thing to just, you know, emphasize. To be fulfilled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And then he continues in verse 10 by saying, so as, and he gave several reasons. Now we're not going into that for this video. I just want you to read the text there and see. Read it slowly, read it carefully, and ask yourselves questions about the content. Ask yourself, why did he pray for this, for instance, and not that? He hasn't, <coughs> sorry, he hasn't mentioned anything else, but he chose to mention this. He's praying for other things. Surely he's praying for other things as well. But why did he choose to mention this point? To these people so that they can understand and be reminded of what the Christian walk of life is all about. It's about the service and worship of God, service to worship of God, surrendering to Him, dying to yourself so that He can manifest within you. It's about Him, not you. It's about His status, not yours. It's about His identity, not yours. It's about what He wants, not you want. So that you can be part of His life, and His kingdom.